2024. Now, this week's I called What a Plaque and why did I do that? Well, you might have seen if you've been following me on social media or if you've overall just seen in the news, there's been a blue plaque erected at Walthamstow Tesco to commemorate the lettuce that was purchased there that lasted longer than the Prime Minister Liz trusted 49 days back in 2022. Of course, it's that sort of trussiversary or whatever you'd like to call it. Um, it's, it's around that time of year. So that's what we, we, we're we looking at. And it was a, a very British way of injecting a bit of humour into the situation of a person who, in reality, cost the country billions of pounds in terms of debt that shouldn't have had to have been paid out um, and many billions of pounds in terms of economic productivity over a time that looked like it was going to cause a, a flash crash or a, a genuine crisis. But there we go. So I like to open with a quote and this week's is about blue plaques and it says blue plaques are plaques that commemorate the lives of notable people and the places they lived, worked or died. They can help raise awareness of a building's historical significance and preserve it. Some say that blue plaques can also increase a property's asking price by up to 25%. Now that was from the AI powered version of Google, October 2024. So welcome to the future on that one. I'm gonna say a bit more about the plaque later. Um, but before we get started, I just wanna have a quick chat about the Boardroom Club. I started alongside Rod Turner. We've been running it for four and a half years now. Boardroom Club is a group set up to help take property businesses to the next level. Rod and I often get asked about one-to-one -one mentoring and it isn't something we provide or have the appetite to provide in the near future because we simply don't have capacity apart from anything else. However, there is a one-to-one -one element to the club and it includes the following. A two to three hour deep dive planning session with myself, Rod and you and that goes all the way through any existing plans you have. Your entire business structure or group breaks it down in a constructive way and builds it back up again. From your visions and your missions all the way to the nuts and bolts of what you need to focus on every day in order to be more successful. Then a monthly session with the other businesses that are part of the club with your own individual slot where Rod and I act as your non-exec directors and the group also offer their observations, thoughts and support. This is delivered on Zoom apart from three days a year when we meet in person. A monthly one-to-one -one call with either Rod or myself on an alternating basis for 30 to 45 minutes as required. And then a private WhatsApp group with Rod and myself if you need support in between or just needed help on a quick decision. Uh, our service level agreement is to reply within 24 hours, but of course we aim to beat that. But likewise, we're a bit busy, so we're not just sitting waiting to reply to people's WhatsApp, so do bear that in mind. But if you're interested in joining, please drop Rod or myself a message on LinkedIn. And that's uh, Rod's is if you just search for Rod Turner on LinkedIn or you can find my profile, Adam Lawrence. So... This was an incredibly busy week with plenty of fulfillment at my end, including a great workshop, which was very well received and more properties purchased too, as this purple patch goes on. Every other email I receive is a portfolio for sale. There's an incredible volume of deals out there at the moment. There's also an incredible volume of dross, of course, and the number one skill I'm always reminded at this time is an ability to get to the nub of the deal very, very quickly in order to save everyone's time. The key is motivation. What's the reason for the sale? If people are being duplicitous, there's just no time for that at the moment. They can wait. On to the matters at hand then in a slightly puzzling week with some signals either way and some concerns that have some investors feeling cautious. The VIX, the volatility index in the USA, is always handy to help us quantify risk in weeks like this. It moved from uh, what they would call a 17 handle over in the States, um, which is a relatively low reading in the scheme of things. It's been down as low as 12 this year. But it also spiked to just over 38 and a half when the August wobble happened. Uh, so it moved from 12, it moved from 12 to around about from 17 earlier in the week to around about 20 and ended the week about 18.5. So what does that mean? Well, it means all these noises of all out war in the Middle East are not being taken overly seriously by the markets. The needle has moved, but not much. Is the market always right? Well, of course not. But in order to form a different opinion, you need research, historical precedent, data or something else rather than just catastrophizing in an economic sense of course meanwhile there's been some other news about interest rates in a significant week that isn't necessarily mirrored in the macro i'm going to use the deep dive to discuss the near-term path of interest rates in some more detail this week because that captivates so much of the investor attention at this time i want to start though with my weekly props to chris watkin who delivers week in week out on property market insights he asks the best trappy questions I know on the UK property market and skillfully exposes misconceptions again and again. 
This week was a great example of that when he asked what percentage of 25 to 34 year olds own their own home in the UK on his LinkedIn account. So it could be mortgaged, could be unencumbered. The answer is 35.5%, but only 9% of people voted for that option or 45.5%, only 1% of people voted for that. The other 91% of people voted mostly for 15.5%, with 25.5% being the next biggest guess. A great example of how the spectre of doom and gloom in the press, or the rhetoric used for historical purposes, completely distorts what the public thinks it knows. Bearing in mind those on Chris's LinkedIn are likely property professionals, or at least close to the industry. That makes it even more incredible, but he delivers these truth bombs time and again. He also tricked me this week by asking how many rentals we've lost since 2020 as a whole. And since 2020, we've actually gained 170,000 rental units. That takes us to 2023. I doubt we're still gaining units today, personally. Um, but it'll be a few months before we have the 2024 figure, which will only take us to March 2024 anyway. But the point is well made. We've also only gained 20,000 rental units since 2017, if we use the same data. So that's the English housing survey data, plus how many empty units there are in the PRS. And it will be a year and a bit before we see what's, to me anyway, clearly playing out in the markets just now. Be actually rubber stamped in terms of the stats, at which point the politicians will finally realise their mistake, and then they'll start conversations about what to do about it. So we're still talking 15 months before it even gets on their radar, in my opinion. But there isn't a real-time stats episode from Chris this week, um, but hopefully those two polls that he put up give you something to think about and remind you to check your facts and not to suppose things. So, moving to the macro, this week of the month is always jam-packed. We need to talk about the Bank of England money and credit report, including the money supply. We can't avoid the final PMIs because we get better reports as the figures get finalised. And then Nationwide released some figures that surprised almost everyone, apart from regular readers and listeners here, of course. And then we have our happy place, or more realistically, the one we just can't let get away, which is the gilts and the swaps. So, the money and credit report. There's lots that I like in here always every month. The press always concentrates on the mortgage approvals, and it isn't the worst single number to pick out of the report in the world by any means. This covers August, and the approval number was just 100 mortgages short of where the sweet spot really lies. And that sweet spot is between 65 and 70,000 mortgage approvals every month, meaning a functioning market moving nicely at around inflation per year. So I'm hoping that September's will, will show somewhere in that sweet spot. I think it probably will. 64,900 approvals in a traditionally quiet month, though, of August is pretty big. It's been two years since a number like this, 72,000 approvals in August 2022, which was truly the calm before the storm. Remortgaging improved a little, but 27,200 from 25,200 the month before is still not historically a big number, as people are seeming to remortgage but kicking and screaming when they need to. And far be it from me to point out that the product transfer rates are pretty shocking at this time. The other important bits are the net debt expansion, 2.9 billion extra net mortgage debt added, which is good for the brokers particularly, but healthy enough for a sector. It's a, it's a little bit over one sixth of 1% of balances. It's a steady percentage if annualised in the sort of low 2% in terms of expansion of mortgage debt. Consumer credit expanded by another 1.3 billion, which is a bit more worrying, a little bit above what's sustainable, let's say. We're talking sort of 6 or 7% year-on-year -year growth there which is a bit more significant and we can't just keep that up permanently so now where we depart, depart the headline catching bits and get to the nitty-gritty there was a bit of a surprise in there to be honest in august the rate on drawn mortgages was 4.84 percent up from 4.81 percent in july that looks high really i mean those mortgages were likely mostly offered around about april or may 2024 where the gilt yield was a bit higher, 4 to 4.3 percent. So perhaps it isn't as high as, as I think it is, but we should see lower numbers for September, October, November, as the yields then started to decay a bit from there. And then if you do a Google trend search for mortgage war, which I did this week, I've seen that phrase popping up a little bit. Um, nothing really shows on that needle until 21st of September. So the mortgages will likely complete more like December, January, I'm sure. But 4.84 still feels pretty painful. 
The average rate on outstanding mortgages also climbed a weenie bit to 3.72%. And of course, that'll keep going up as the new number um, is well above the cost of the outstanding stock. There's still a healthy gap between those two figures. And I'd like to see that gap cross back over because then I'd really know we were out of the interest rate woods as far as this pretty swift climb from late 2021 onwards has gone when it comes to rates. The average rate for a new personal loan, in case you wondered, is 9.27% at this time. Ouch, that's pretty much a wholesale bridging rate, really. It is unsecured, I guess, if you don't count your personal credit rating as security anyway, which you really should. The money supply also contracted again slightly, which helps to bring inflation back into line. We're still above the trend line as far as we would have been if COVID had never happened, but just a little bit above that trend line. So, of course, we've had plenty more inflation in that period. So in terms of stimulus and all the rest of it, the forced inflation, the old money finds a home side of the argument that the monetarists like, seems to have stopped as of now. This is pleasing. US money supply has calmed comparatively as well, but it doesn't look like it's truly been all absorbed in inflation in the US, which still makes me more concerned for their pandemic premium on inflation, more so than the UK's premium. And this is a historical precedent I'm referring to here, but observed in prior pandemics, which tended to last 30 to 40 years and manifested itself in inflation half a percent to 1% higher than it otherwise was in longer wave cycles that didn't involve pandemics. So the market it looks healthy enough in terms of broader credit, although rates still haven't really worked their way down in terms of rates that people are paying. I didn't expect that 4.84% for August, I must say, but also perhaps people weren't working hard enough with their brokers to keep rechecking rates when they're already in a mortgage situation. And I do say this a lot, but it always bears repeating. Keep checking for lower rates in the cycles where rates are dropping. I haven't counted the actual quantum, but my goodness, I've saved a few quid over the past few years by doing that. Offers can be reissued and every penny counts. Pennies saved are better than pennies earned thanks to our old friend HMRC. So moving on to the PMIs, the purchasing managers indices, and things played out just as I said they would from a flash estimate of 52.8, services actually printed 52.4 for September, and similarly the composite flash estimate of 52.9, which is healthy, lost another 0.3 points and ended at 52.6 for September. A little bit colder than we would like, but hanging on there in expansionary territory. We also get the construction PMI for September and we don't see a flash estimate for that and we'll start with that given our interest in construction industry. So a fantastic headline, fastest upturn in construction output since April 2022, a really positive vibe. Why? Well down one level, steepest rise in civil engineering activity since June 2021. The slight dampener, cost pressures intensify in September. The actual index, 57.2, absolutely smashed the estimates of 53.1. 59.0 in civils was that leading reason, but 55.2 in commercial building and 54.3 in house building are both really positive, especially how few housing starts we've had in the figures that were released this week for Q2. Q3's print will be a dramatic improvement, clearly. Input costs were the worst they've been for 16 months in spite of a moderate expansion of employment numbers and faster purchasing activity. Optimism went south, back down to about April's levels, just as in most sectors of the economy, but way above last October. Rising sales, lower borrowing costs and the potential for stronger house building demand were all cited as supporting factors. So what did we learn that we hadn't already learned from the other flash PMIs last week. Well, business optimism increased compared to August, but only slightly, with the budget cited again as a reason to delay decision making. Things improved but in a subdued fashion in terms of output, new work and employment, but still improved. The strap line prices charged inflation lowest since February 2021 is a clear message to the rate setters. And we'll talk more about that in the deep dive. The overall message in construction and manufacturing is that wage pressures have eased a lot, but materials are still coming in more expensive, especially if affected in any way by the Red Sea situation. I can't see enough on the PMIs. I'm going to just step sideways into the growth figures that were released this week, because what we had was a revision to the quarter two figures down 0.1%. So we went from 0.6 to 0.5 for the UK. So that puts us at 1.2 or slightly above in the first half of this year. Not bad. The year on year moved from 0.7 to 0, moved to 0.7 down from 0.9, but 
but that's only because 2023 was revised upwards from 0.1 to 0.3. So we were 0.2% better off at this time last year than we thought we were. So we started from a higher base, effectively. The revisions go on for up to two years after the figures are first released, which can be a bit frustrating, but then it's a case of the old, when the facts change, I change my mind, sir. What do you do? This report also revisited the RHDI figures, the real household disposable income, which I particularly like. 1.3% print for the quarter. So we've had the last four quarters at 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1.6 and 1.3, all in positively positive territory, all look pretty good historically for households. So that tells you a bit about the real improvement there's been over the last 12 months for household incomes, generally speaking. You have to really go back and cherry pick four quarters in a row from quarter two 2017 to quarter one 2018 to get figures that were that good for households. But of course, they did take a kicking in 2021 and 2022, thanks to inflation, cost of living crisis, etc, etc. And that has taken its time to work through all these figures. So savings at 10% of household income is also a downwards revision, but it's still historically high. We had between 5 and 6% in 2019, and between 2016 and 2019, the savings ratio was between 4 and 6% as the norm. So very little variance to speak of prior the, the pandemic. But that consumer confidence or room to breathe or whatever you want to call it has just not come back yet. The published 10% is an improvement from a consumption perspective, though, because the forecasting bodies were talking about 11% or more. Um, so that's somewhat of an improvement from that perspective. Perversely, this really should have contributed to riding, right, revising the GDP figures upwards, but yet they've moved downwards. Now, as I say, nothing is done as yet, but these mysteries and anomalies always appear in the ONS data on a regular basis. I'm not trying to imply they're incorrect, just that they're subject to change. So, Nationwide's House Price Index included a quarterly regional breakdown as well as the national figures. 0.7% increase on the month, the consensus was only 0.1. 3.2% increase on the year. Rather unlike the single digit decline or remaining broadly flat prediction for 2024 that Nationwide came up with at the beginning of the year. They still see prices 2% off the highs of summer 2022, though. The sharpest observation from their chief economist is that income growth continues to outstrip house price growth in recent months, and of course, borrowing costs have edged lower in anticipation of lower interest rates in coming quarters, further improving affordability and underpinning a modest increase. Actually, year on year, it's massive, as the walking real-time figures have proven again and again, and a massive increase on pre-pandemic activity. Their mistake here is still claiming that activity in house prices is subdued by historic standards. Depends how historic you want to be, of course, but the market is doing more transactions and moving faster than 2019, for sure, at this point, or 2017 to 2019. Now, bear in mind, those, those years didn't set the world on fire for growth. They did amble forward. I'd like to think that slow and steady wins the race. So the regional breakdowns then. It won't surprise you to hear Northern Ireland is still crushing it in front of the pack at 8.6% year on year for house prices. And both Scotland and Wales moved the needle a fair bit. Both were up 1.4% year on year last quarter. So Scotland up 43 and Wales 25 The North West continued its dominance of England by moving up 5% year on year in what can only be described as a healthy market. Now, East Anglia was the only region going backwards, according to Nationwide, minus 0.8 per year. The Midlands looking fairly static, plus one West Midlands, plus 1.8 East Midlands, and London at 2%. The rest of the South is just limping forward, really, plus 0.6% per year. So the further south we go, the more the figures are kept in check still. Now, there's a lot of overall noise in the press at the moment about larger corporates going back to the office, particularly Amazon. And then in spite of the noise from the business secretary, Mr. Reynolds, the likelihood is this will reverse and the like need to live nearer the office and the economic engine that is London, especially now levelling up doesn't seem to be a phrase anymore. And whatever's replaced it doesn't really look on the slate, particularly in this administration at this time. Over the next few years, I expect the South to start to perform strongly again, especially as rates come downwards, in my view, because it's hurt a lot more. It's a lot more rate sensitive than it is in the North as well. So... The growth by type is also an interesting breakdown. Terraced houses are up 3.5% year on year, but detached are only up a little over 1.5%. And that might be because there's more detached houses in the south, although um, by, by proportion, I'm not sure. I don't know the figures on that. Um, 
Now my real favorite part of the nationwide quarterly data, the real house price index. For context, this looks at house prices and adjusts for RPI, the retail price index. Now that's not anyone apart from maybe a freeholders uh, idea of inflation these days. CPI took over from the early 2000s. However, their data goes back 50 years and so RPI is appropriate. Some also still think it represents real inflation more than CPI does just because it's always higher and they basically think CPI is like cooking the books a little bit. Now I don't think there's a lot of substance to this allegation but I prefer watching OOH as regular listeners will know the owner occupier cost of housing and also CPIH which, which reflects that housing element in there which from a numbers perspective looks a lot like RPI at the moment. So Q3, in spite of positive noises by Nationwide, delivered to us the lowest real house price on this measure since quarter three of 2013. And not just that, but zooming out further, showed that that was a particularly historic or a decade-long blip. Before that, the 2024 figure, adjusted for RPI, more represents house prices in Q1 of 2003, so over 20 years ago. So after 2003, we had a tear upwards in real terms, uh, after that quarter, house prices in real terms moved up over 28% in four and a half years, although we know now that was a very unsustainable boom. And then the years after 2013 were a bit calmer, but in the three and a half years after that, that low in 2013, real house prices still moved up over 18% in real terms over that three and a half years. So remember, you'd have to put inflation on top of that. And this tells you a little bit about why I'm so confident house prices in the UK are going to be going north over the next five years. So that period also coincided with the end in meteoric growth, of course, in the PRS. So we do need to be cautious about that. Georgie Boy, my friend George Osborne, and his assassinator budget of 2015. It, but if we adjust for wages, we don't see anything particularly different. And if we consider affordability, people are still crying wolf compared to historic situations. However, I think there's a few differences compared to uh, historic situations. So firstly, we tend to look at house prices as a multiple of income and not household income. We're looking at individual incomes, individual median income. I think this is a false flag and I pretty much reject this as reasonable analysis. The number of incomes in an average property owning household has moved up from low one point something times to higher one point something times over the past several decades. Both participants have got much more likelihood of having a full time job or at least a, a, a part time job. Households with 0 point something times of full time income, people like single parents, for example, much more reliant on the benefit system. Well, it's not going to be realistic to expect them to be homeowners anyway. So when we look at total pay in terms of average weekly earnings, the ONS measure, we see a 52.8 increase over the last 20 years. House prices are up 73.7 percent in the same time period. So how can prices move upwards from here when wages haven't kept up with them? Well, partially because of the point I've already made and partially because credit has been a lot cheaper. It's now a bit cheaper than it was 20 years ago. If I go into the Bank of England database, 75% loan to value product was 5.44% 20 years ago compared to that 4.84% from today. But as I say, that high fours, I'm expecting that to drift into mid and low fours based on what's already happened with yields and then below that in the medium term. Aside from the price of credit, the stretch of credit is also important. So, for example, Nationwide themselves have recently announced six times earnings as a criteria they will look at. There are also far more options around longer terms, guarantors and the likes, all of which stretch out that possibility of using credit to buy houses with a general focus on sustainability of credit growth, certainly much more so than 20 years ago, for sure. So overall conditions are actually much kinder even though the overall scoring criteria is most definitely harder. You can also just look at it as almost all of the bad news is out of the way. And don't forget, with rents moving forward quite aggressively, many more are encouraged by the stick to get on with it and buy a house if they have the support of bank of mum and dad, mostly speaking. People aren't stupid, and whilst they tend to make credit decisions like car loans based on what they can afford every month rather than the actual value, and they can definitely apply the same to house purchases, they aren't going to sit and pay a massive rent premium for flexibility, etc., unless they really need to. They're going to try and find a way to buy. So please note this isn't the same as comparing rent to mortgage payments directly. I have a huge soapbox rant about this from time to time. Rent includes buildings insurance, maintenance, compliance, structural issues, and the time spent managing all of those as well. It also represents risk. 
So this represents some somewhere between a 15 and 30 percent premium, in my view, depending on the location and the age of the property in terms of monthly payment of rent. So a rent of a thousand pounds a month might be equivalent to a mortgage of 1300 pounds per month in reality. Um, or certainly a cost base of £1,300 per month, even if that wasn't the mortgage payment itself. The total cost of owning the property rather than renting it is what I mean. So we've got to frame the conversation realistically. And that's before we make the average allowance for any of average deposit, which sits at about 53 to 54 k in the UK. They might That would be able to get some returns otherwise in an ISA, maybe netting 4%, a couple of thousand quid a year in opportunity costs, which really really should be considered and included, even if many wouldn't necessarily make the decision based on that. And indeed, if you're reliant on the bank of mum and dad, the opportunity cost piece isn't really relevant, unless bank of mum and dad is offering the money with no strings attached and giving you the choice of whether to invest it or spend it on a house deposit. So one more insight into why I think over the next five year period, or perhaps a little bit shorter, house prices have got a really bright future and will really start to tear upwards and surprise a few people. And that will lead us nicely into the deep dive today. But before we get there, I must talk about the gilts and the swaps. So prepare your sad faces, please. So if you followed the headlines this week, you'll have seen mortgage wars and the governor of the Bank of England suggesting more aggressive rate cuts. However, be warned, the five year gilt opened this week at 3.87, which was a gap up from the close. And it closed at 4.019. The Thursday close was 3.874. So all the work really was done on Friday. What went wrong on Friday? Well, blame the US. They had hot job creation figures which was a reversal of the august wobble based on july's figures and they had lower than expected unemployment as well so meaning that instead we had headlines saying the fed had made a mistake with their 50 basis points cut so therefore we went 15 basis points in the wrong direction on friday on the basis of more bearish chat about the pace of cutting rates there's a little bit more about that later on as well so the swaps offered much better news because the five-year swap still closed at 3.587 on Thursday night and both the seven and the 10 year money look similarly cheap if anyone's thinking about fixing for longer at this time. That discount of 30 basis points being preserved is still a bit of a head scratcher for me but in the absence of any further advances boom boom on my analysis last week we will just continue to remain positive about it. I suspect that Friday's moves will not have helped but there's no point worrying on a daily or hourly basis. It isn't as though we have a lettuce as Prime Minister more of a Napoleon style character and I mean that from the animal farm perspective rather than the French emperor perspective. But monitoring will, of course, continue into the deep dive. And I have to mark that special moment again, two years after the post Kamikaze budget and the very swift career of Mary Elizabeth Truss. She was this week commemorated in a blue plaque that I had to use as the graphic for this week's uh, supplement. It made me chortle, although her cost to the economy and the reputation internationally of the UK was no laughing matter. Her economic naivety and overall lack of ability was the single greatest example of the Peter principle of all time that I'm aware of, promotion to your level of incompetence. And she had clearly gone several levels beyond that. But blue plaques increase the value of buildings, so I'm considering that annual pilgrimage to Walthamstow Tesco, if you're interested. There are richer historical moments, but this was a seriously important and beautifully British one. We can look with some further humour at this point as the rate landscape got a lot better quickly once she was gone, but then it deteriorated even further when market forces kicked back in. However, the early warning she gave things, whilst it was a costly jolt, especially to pension funds, was actually helpful in deflating the bubble that was inflating with some speed, and in many ways it did us a bit of a favour. It might be a few years before we can look upon it charitably, but luckily, the recovery from said situations put things back on a keel, which could see decent growth in early 2024. The rest of this parliament and economic performance in general will be judged on its merits, rather than how many freebies it does or doesn't take, and which freebies are OK and which aren't, according to some arbitrary rules. OK, on to the heavier stuff now that we've had the salad anyway. A really interesting week for rates chatter, and possibly nothing like you'd expected on the guilt front. It surprised me as I followed it throughout the week, apart from on Friday, of course, when the US figures meant we were only going one way. So Mr. Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, has only really said two things of interest this week, which is better than his usual average. Firstly, he said rate cutting could be more aggressive. Now, this changed expectations for December's meeting rather more than November's, with the immediate market aftermath predicting a 61% chance of a December cut. 
November sin is a close to 100% probability, which I've been criticising more on an overly optimistic basis than a real thought that we will hold rates in November. It does look like we will. We will cut. The other soundbite was around the oil price and recent sharp rises. Brent had dipped below $70 a barrel, and a stronger pound was really helping with prices at the pumps, you might have noticed. Bailey's comments put sterling down almost 2%, and Brent hit 78 bucks by the end of the week in a 10% rise. All eyes are on Israel and Iran. It is as simple as that, although there was also a Houthi attack on an oil tanker in the Red Sea this week, which also had nerves jangling further, but more so on an ongoing basis. For context, in November 23 and April 24, Brent was above $90 a barrel, so it's a concerning and fast direction of travel, which does have inflationary consequences, but it isn't shifting a paradigm unless we see another 20% go on the price in coming weeks, which of course is not impossible. Oil can be very volatile in these situations. Now, I don't speculate at all on the oil price. I'm more a follower and a reporter than anything. I knew when it was negative in the pandemic that that wouldn't last, of course, or when it was $20 a barrel back in 2015, that it was unlikely to persist at that level. Inflation adjusted, however, it doesn't look that expensive in real terms at the moment. A dollar thirty-one is also still a positive exchange rate compared to say two years ago, when the lettuce lowered it to one dollar and three cents briefly. But it has dropped from the week's high of one thirty-four, which I don't expect to see again for a while, which affects oil, gold, Bitcoin, everything priced in the mighty greenback. Again, though, the figure for the last few months has been more like a dollar twenty-nine. So we haven't rode backwards quite yet, it's just a trend to be aware of. So Bailey's take was simply that the bank is monitoring these events extremely closely. Now, all of this would put me off betting the farm on a, a rate cut in November, let alone December. Let's just see the economic news play out, because this post-election wobble is guaranteed to continue in October as businesses wait for the budget like lambs at the abattoir. Now, a reason not to get carried away expecting these cuts just to line up in an orderly fashion, aside from the upside risks in the Middle East, which look at least as lively as they have, as we approach one year since October the 7th, 2023. But as I say, I watch the markets there rather than forming my own viewpoint. Unless we get to extreme panic situations, then it might be an idea to do something differently. So the bank had to send out the chief economist to steady the ship somewhat after Mr. Bailey had said this week. And Mr. Pill has been a lot more hawkish than some other members of the committee without being a committed hawk. Like his predecessor, of whom I was and still am a massive fan, Andy Haldane, Hugh Pill is regularly caught trying to do the right thing. His chat also shored up Sterling a little bit. His actual words, while further cuts in bank rate remain in prospect should the economic and inflation outlook evolve broadly as expected, it will be important to guard against the risk of cutting rates either too far or too fast. So, he's, what, he's communicating several things there, isn't he? One, that we're expecting to cut rates. He doesn't want to change the market's opinion on any of that, but he's basically saying, look, Really, we're still looking at being relatively patient and relatively slow with these cuts. Gave us a bit more meat than what Mr. Bailey said. It's very much in line with what I think the average member or the average feeling on the bank's monetary policy committee is at this time. We need lower risks, which is not happening within a few weeks, you wouldn't think. We need lower inflation. Well, that's still coming in below expectations, even though it's moving back upwards a little bit, basically to do with how it's calculated. We need some bad economic data to an extent, which is almost guaranteed for September and October. I don't mean really bad, but I mean trending the wrong way due to, apart from anything else, this looming budget. And we need the lack of another crisis, of course, which is always the case for things to play out as we expect. But you can see there, even at the high level, the complexity of this task. And once again, I remind you that we really care most about the swap rate, not the base rate. However, I wanted to expand on a point I've made at a couple of presentations recently to different audiences. This is where we need to reintroduce R star, which I might have mentioned in the past. The concept is one of the natural rate of interest and is normally reserved for economic textbooks. However, it's quite a simple one. R star is simply the bank rate that would see the economy performing normally, not being restricted by higher rates, as it currently is, nearly everybody agrees, but also not being assisted by lower rates, as happens in recessions, etc., as happened after the financial crisis. Now, our star gets a bit of airtime on occasion. The deputy governor before Ben Broadbent, who was called Charlie Bean, in the earlier part of the 2010s, revealed that the bank's overall position on our star was about 2.5% in the new world after the financial crash had played out, mostly. The bank then, as you'll know, then proceeded to hold the rate under 1% for the whole decade, of course, 
and had a bit of egg on face when their forward guidance around rate rises only ever once got from 0.5 to 0.75 and instead there were several drops in the interim. The position now is more like 3 to 4% being the number or R star. So why care about all this when it doesn't seem to go there anyway? Well, the inaction on the base rate in the 2020s now looks rather weak, and the reputation of Mark Carney means that he gets away without too much criticism at all now that we know the facts, although you do see people saying it uh, in bits and bobs in time and again. I do feel this lesson, we should have tried to get closer to R star, would be fresh in the minds of the current committee. I also have some sympathy for another argument which ties into all of this. A lot of commentators, who by their own admission are not trained economists, saw the raising of interest rates in the face of supply-side shocks as a pointless exercise. They were, as often in these situations, right after a fashion, or at least they had a point. Rates going up would not address the root cause of supply-side shocks. However, that wasn't the point of doing it. The point of doing it was to manage risk. It stopped the economy from taking off, which could have seen even higher inflation. And that's all well and good. But when can we remove or, or calm down some of these risk management measures then? Well, back to one of the points I've already made, when risks are lower. They were looking potentially lower, but not really from a geopolitical perspective, of course. And that we're a massive importer of energy. We're extremely dependent in the UK on the import of oil alongside other forms of fossil fuels. So Bailey's comments were interesting. Did he just say, he sounded a bit like he might just be following the Fed, really. They'd cut half a percent, and before the end of the week, this week, they'd been praised, really, because it looked like it was the right thing to do. And now they're being criticised as, as, uh, as the facts change, people change their minds. Um, I don't think he has much of a deep understanding of economics, if I'm honest with you. And I'm genuinely, generally pleased that he seems to copy, or at least be heavily influenced, by the deputy governor. A cut in base rates would help the economy massively. But the expectation of a cut might just be enough. When the moment in time comes for the Office for Budgetary Responsibility, who remember write the script on what the entire budget is based on, then the path for expected rates will be a consideration. It isn't necessarily as cross-sectional of that. We're not saying, right, today we're taking the rate um, and that's the rate we're going to use for the forecast for the next 12 months or whatever. But if everyone assumes a rate cut in November is a complete banker and then thinks December's a strong probability, that will all be priced into the report. And that helps Rachel Reeves massively as it lowers the debt burden on new debt creation, particularly in the shorter term, which is a rather regular occurrence, of course. And then the 10 year gilt, the most liquid long term one, doesn't look much different in profile than it did in March when the last OBR forecast was released. So perhaps there won't be much in that point, but expectations of cuts have become much, much clearer. And of course, we've had an actual cut since as well. So I'd be surprised if the outlook wasn't improved. All of the recent language, for example, in the PMI reports that I go through, has been telling the rate setters that the sectors all around are ready for further cuts and inflation is much more under control. So just the oil price in the Middle East to watch then? Well, to an extent, any physical imports obviously remain still at risk. Yields are at or above their 52-week averages, which is one of the indicators a technical analyst would look at. These sorts of upside risks are exactly why I've remained fairly bearish about all of this when it comes to the speed of rate cuts. I've been criticised time and again by brokers and commentators for suggesting rates will stay high. I think they largely misunderstand me. There are few individuals that have more skin in the game than I do on wanting interest rates to be lower than they can't. That is a complete irrelevance when it comes to effective analysis. I have to predict what I think the Bank of England will do which is relatively easy, of course, especially as we approach the meetings, as long as the requisite amount of prep work is done. Then I have to predict the gilts and swaps markets, which is much harder, and is, of course, one of the better remunerated skills in the world. So I'm trying to bat at one of the highest levels there. What I do know when I look at the yield curve, remember it puts together all the bond yields of all the bonds of all durations, from three months to 50 years duration, is that it looks almost exactly the same shape as it did one year ago, but shifted downwards. It's moved about 50 basis points, half a percent in 12 months. The shape being exactly the same is a little bit anomalous and tells us how the signals that come normally from inverted yield curves have not been performing over the recent years as well, because we would have expected the shape to have shifted to the left, not just downwards, because one year has passed. I hope that makes sense. And this brings us back to our star. R star, I would argue, the one we really care about is the five-year R star, because we're looking at five-year mortgage durations, which is not the same as the five-year yield curve as at today. 
However, the five year particularly has been at a low point on the curve. The low points today are actually at three and seven, but there isn't a lot in it. But today is important for decisions as of today. The path over the next five years is what I really care about and what I'm trying to predict in terms of procurement and deployment of resources in general. So let me try and rephrase that. What the five year is trying to predict in many ways is the average base rate over the next five years. They know what the rate will be for the next month and there's a lot more uncertainty as time goes on because the base rate sets the immediate price of money in interest rate terms. So you could think about it as 60 one month yield predictions in a row effectively. What I'm trying to predict is how the five year prediction shifts as time goes on. And the idea is always that in the absence of other pressures, crises, pandemics and the likes, the interest rate should return to R star. For those who did economics moons ago, you will remember the concept of equilibrium. You'll also appreciate it's just that, it's a concept rather than a day-to-day -day reality. You'll also appreciate that it's in the interest of the media to convince us all that we lurch from one crisis to the next, which is often why the best advice is not to read the news or not to engage in it. But you can see why though, if the yield curve is inverted, but reset isn't on the horizon what ends up happening hedge funds borrow from the future at lower rates like the three five or seven year and invest at the shorter term rate if you'd done that and many did last year you'd have a nice steep one year set of returns and you still have that same exact steep curve downwards in terms of returns for the next one year now the mechanics of doing this are much much more complex than this so please don't go away and try it but there are higher returns to be garnered in overnight markets markets, commercial paper, things like that. And these funds sometimes lever these trades by 100x or even 500x. And they consider it as basically arbitrage, which it's close to, although it's not arbitrage in its purest form. So it might look like buttons in terms of the differences. But to an extent, this keeps the yield curve honest as people borrow from here and invest here and all the rest of it. So it isn't honest at all points because the very front end is set by the rate setters. It's set by the central banks. So if you think interest rates are well above R star, and the recession isn't on the horizon, you're rewarded for the falsely high rates that have been on our plate ever since the risks were managed accordingly. And whilst this is somewhat technical, is a much better argument for aggressive rate cuts, at least down towards our start or closer to it. So we need to remember what message they send out and what time frames we're talking about. It's always important to note that we're talking six to 24 months. That's what the rate setters are really know that they're influencing. Although, of course, they influence the stock market if they change the rates not in six to 24 months time although well, stock market of course a function of future cash flows when it comes to concepts like discounted cash flow analysis so what are the expectations in six to 24 months it looks safe to say now that wages will be calming further and performing more normally some sectors will see aggressive price rises if reliant on minimum wage workers as the next rise kicks in in six months time the pension triple lot will look after those claiming it in the way they've become accustomed to at the cost of the working population, of course, because the scheme is just that. It's a Ponzi. I think we've fallen into the trap of not trying to get to our star quickly or efficiently enough. We manage where we are rather than being willing to cut rates, but be open about that fact. If the facts change, we might need to change them. Should rates go up and down like a yo-yo? No. But when we amend in quarter point increments or even smaller when there's been crises, an approach that has been recommended and one I would support is changes of 0.1 one percent why would this make a difference well it would be so much easier to send signals to markets and firms imagine if this year we could have cut by 0.1 as soon as inflation hit two percent even in the knowledge it might creep back up the thoughts were at the time that things would creep up a bit more than it has although all the other measures that really matter are still above three percent anyway an earlier signal more positivity better investment what is there not to like about that i'm not saying employ a completely neurodiverse npc who would change the rate once a week that would not help us but smaller increments would be great for messaging and confidence building making the meeting monthly rather than six or seven weekly given the combined several million quid a year salary of the members of said committee might also offer a bit better value and give us some more regular guidance on rates so where does that leave us theoretically dazzled but with no further idea about the path of rates well actually i think it helps me perform a pretty good idea actually and i would say listen to the chief economist not the governor downwards almost certainly slow and steady is likely to win the race down about one percent from here on base rate over the next 12 months gilts 
down about half a percent from here, perhaps three quarters on yields in the next 12 months. Resultant mortgage rates perhaps down half a percent from here in the sort of five percent region ish for limited company buy to let in 12 months time. And then it taking more like two years to see more like four and a half percent rates. Now, look, this is on the basis of nothing going wrong. But 90 plus percent of the time, things really aren't going wrong. They might seem like they are, but it's just push and pull factors in markets. It's just media creating headlines. It isn't a pandemic. It isn't a total withdrawal of credit like we had in 2009. It's slow and steady growth in various factors, various ways that push prices forwards over time and help to inflate away any debt we're lucky enough to have as long as it remains to be good debt. So I hope that was interesting. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. And the juice worth the squeeze in terms of conclusions. But remember, when the facts change, sir, I change my mind. What do you do? So before I go for this week, please save the date for the next Property Business Workshop, Thursday, January the 16th. We'll have some brilliant subject matter, planning, efficiencies, and also financial accounting and bookkeeping. So I'm not talking about how to use zero. I'm talking about how to ensure reporting is set up correctly and then how to monitor it on an effective, ongoing, monthly basis. And that will once again be in central London. So there's only one way we can deal with all of this ongoing noise and excitement. Keep calm, always listen to the supplement and carry on. Thanks for listening.